The Music is Life podcast has our own merch now over on tpublic.com. Click the link below in the video description. Looking for some new threads? We got t-shirts, long sleeves, hoodies, crew neck sweatshirts, tank tops, baseball tees, and also clothes for kids and onesies for your little infant metalheads. Don't want clothes but love the Java? We got you covered with coffee mugs and travel mugs. Need protection for your electronics? We've also got phone and laptop cases. We've got everything you're looking for at the tpublic.com Music is Life podcast store. Use my link below for fast service. Thanks for your support. TerraNut is proud to offer you a natural nut bar chock full of healthy fats, minerals, and protein that meet your demands. Go to their website, www.terranut.com. You can order from them directly and they will ship it to you. Use my coupon code LUMAVS and you will get a 25% discount on your first order. TerraNut Superfood Snacks, www.terranut.com. Don't forget to use coupon code LUMAVS at checkout. Fuel your life. By the way, I, I just wanted to let you know before we start the interview, I was driving home and I had the album High and Dry on in the car. Mm-hmm. And she asked me, Daddy, who's this? I said, this is one of Daddy's mm-hmm. favorite bands, Def Leppard, honey. And she goes, I like Def Leppard. And I was like, yes. yes! <laughs> Raising her right. <laughs> it's in her genes. Right. I don't think she has a choice. It's in her blood. <laughs> Ready and waiting for you now If it's a fight that you dare see We've acquired our strength through pain No more are we pathetic game We do are the reason why we claim That we've all become this way And I regret this prison that I created for myself Music is Live Podcast, this is your host Lou Mavs Check out everything you need to know about the show over at musicaslivepodcast.com. So I'm happy to say I got Lady D, Denise Escobar, back in the house. Denise, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing all right. Chilling like a villain, eating chicken. No, I had salmon tonight. No, anyways, that was bad. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm happy to say that the episode you and I did, our debut episode together, our top 10 favorite Def Leppard songs, has had uh, a pretty good impact, both in terms of views and listens. Yay! Yes, yeah. And I think I figured out yeah. how to top it, and that is our special guest tonight. Right here, we got Lorelai Shellis in the house. <laughs> That's me. You got me. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, in the 1980s and 1990s, our guest was a model who rocked the runways from New York to Paris, having modeled for Chanel and Karl Lagerfeld, among others. She graced centerfolds for the best photographers in the most gorgeous locations. She's currently an author and a fashion designer. Her book, Runway Runaway, a backstage pass to fashion, romance and rock and roll, is available now through her website. Link in the description below. And she has a fashion line, The Dream Dress by Runway Runaway, which is also available. And we'll talk to her more about it. But one thing about our guest that most people would know her from, is she was in love and engaged to one of the musicians who influenced a generation of musicians, especially guitar players. And that man is, not was, is Steve Clark of Def Leppard, for whom she has won the love and admiration of Def Leppard fans around the world, including us. Mm-hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, Denise and I are proud to welcome to the Music is Live podcast, the one, the only, the lovely Lorelai Shellist. Oh my God. Hey, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I am so touched. That was a lovely introduction. And it's, it's, you know, it surprises me to hear, you know, some of those things because it just makes me happy that, you know, you guys feel that way. Good. Yay. <laughs> well, it's not every day I'm in a Zoom call with two beautiful women. So, yay me. <laughs> <laughs> Keep so dreaming. The, the, all your dreams coming true. <laughs> 
<laughs> Lorelai joins us today on Zoom. And again, thank you so much for joining myself and Denise on the podcast. So, oh, honey, you're welcome. Thank it's you. fun. <laughs> so we have a list of questions that we want to ask you all about you, your life, your career. And again, I just want to say one thing. Buy this book. <laughs> It is such an incredible read. It is. And if you want to listen, because I listened to it and I liked that better than possibly reading it because it was your oh, you voice. Did. Oh, you, you did. You yeah. got the audible version. We both got the listened audible to the version. audible version. Yeah. Because I like oh my God. the author narrated. I love that. Yeah. Thank and that's you. why you, your voice, because I was listening to your voice for so long and I like, I feel like I know you. <laughs> Well, seriously, you are so good at reading books, not just your own. I mean, yeah. you should be like a novelist, like speaker for like Harlequin novels. I mean, you're so good. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. That's so cool. You know, I did that by myself. Like, I, you know, I had a friend who set me up with so like, you know, the microphone and whatever needed to be plugged into my computer. And I would just go in to this room uh, downstairs in this basement apartment here where I live. And I would uh, just put these headphones on and just read for like until my tongue started to twist and then I'd stop oh, and then I'd wow. go back in. But I'd ne- wow. I had done voice work before. I had done a lot of commercials when I was living in Nashville uh, during the 90s. Uh, I used to do, uh, they'd call me in to do the commercials for like the new Ty Hendren. Hendren album had come out or something like that, or I would do little jingles. And so I started getting, you know, uh, using my voice and getting paid for it. And I loved it because I didn't have to go put on makeup (laughs) because I'd been (laughs) a model for all those years. And it was like going to work was a lot of work, you know, I had to do is show up and open my mouth and (laughs) and I was making money and they would pay well. And so, um, but then I moved back to LA and in LA, there's just so much more competition. I mean, there, and, mm-hmm. uh, and not only that voiceovers now, most narrators are all highly paid actors voices. They want voices that everybody knows, like, you know, Matthew Morgan McConaughey. Freeman <laughs> yeah, and Matthew McConaughey yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you'll, you'll hear the same voices and those they're making a lot of money. And I'm like, Hey, wait a minute. You guys had a, movie career like leave some right. work for the rest of us you know you have right. to do everything you have to take everyone's job you know <laughs> so anyway come on man but, people gotta eat give some work to Lorelai come on yeah. <laughs> no but it was like so I I didn't pursue it as a career but then when I when it was time to do the book and there was the availability of doing audible books it had just started so um, I, I figured, well, yeah, I'm going to be the one to read it. I can't, I wasn't going to pay someone. It was cost me enough money to write the book. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it takes a lot of time and, you know, time that you're not working, you know, to, to, to yeah. put into a book like that or any kind of book, I think. I Unless- wanted to ask you though, who did the interstitial music in between the chapter breakdowns? Oh, okay. So that, that's a dear friend of mine. His name is Nick Glennie Smith. And he's a film composer. He's also an orchestrator. And I met him, you know, I've just known him through the business. He was partners with another guy named Mal Luker, who was a scoring engineer for uh, soundtracks and things like that. And Steve and I became friends with Mal. um, Well, I was already friends with him. I introduced Steve and we were all friends. And he lived in Munich at that time. He and Nick and all of us live in the same area. And... uh, we all just became really good friends. And so if you Google Nick Aww. Lenny Smith, you'll see more about what he he's done. He did. He wrote the score for the film Sec- Secretariat. The one. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Horse. The horse. The one yeah. About the horse. Yeah. And he did. A, there was a Mel, he's, Mel Gibson movie. Uh, we were. We were soldiers. We were soldiers. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. And some other really, really oh, wow. great films. And there was one piece that was actually they used at Ronald Reagan's funeral when he died that came out of oh. uh, I think it came out of We Were Soldiers. Yeah. He's a really talented oh. guy. So anyway, uh, he was actually living in my I have an apartment building. I have four units. And so he was renting one of the units and he had his whole music scene there. You know, his his boards and stuff like that. Cause he actually lives in Virginia with his wife and kids or, well, they're all grown anyway. He <laughs> uh, he's the guy who wrote that song, that music. And another girlfriend of ours actually uh, sang the uh, 
lyrics to it. And her name is Christy Rose and she's a torch singer from Nashville. And so that was the music that was in between. That's cool. That's very cool. Because of my busy life and schedule, especially with (laughs) raising a three-year-old, I never really have a chance to sit down and read a book. But I do listen to plenty of audio ones, especially ones that are biographies. I prefer biographies the most because I love learning about people. And I think I speak for myself and Denise. We became so engulfed in everything Mm -hmm. that your book had. And we were just like, my God, this woman lived like the lives of like, like 10 lives in one living. Like 10 and people. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, you, you are a warrior. You are a freaking warrior is what you are. Wow. Well, that's empowering. And I, I got to be honest with you. I thank you because like there are some days where you really need to hear that. And today was kind of one of those days. I woke huh. up this morning and I was like kind of in a funk and I was kind of a little grumpy with Larry and I was he, he's like god what's up and I was like I'm taking Iggy for a walk and I went out and I walked with Iggy in the park and I went gosh I feel I don't know I just felt like I was grumpy and why am I and like he didn't do anything I wasn't mad and I, I was just rah, 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 like in one of these <laughs> moods and I came back and I put my arms around him and I go I'm sorry, you know, I just, you're right. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm kind of in a mood. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and I just felt like some emotion coming forward. And I thought, and I started to get teary eyed. And I thought, wow, what is happening? And it's like, for the most part, and I think we all work hard at sort of keeping in an up mood every day and like getting on with life and, you know, when stuff is hard, you just soldier on through. But there are those yeah. days where you go, I think you're just, I just felt like, uh, I just need to release this, you know? Right. So lovely to hear you say that, that, you know, because it helps me to keep soldiering on, you know? Awesome. There's a lot to do in life, you know? mm, So we will, uh, we will start with the questions. So your book, Runway, Runway. Runway, runaway. That is a tongue twister, but I'll get- I know, right? <laughs> I'm glad I got it right in the uh, intro, which is available on hard copy, PDF, and audio format. is a great read and is an honest look into the life that you lived. Modeling, music, jet setting around the world, overcoming adversity, both in terms of family and relationships, loss, neglect, and dealing with toxicity in situations that others can relate to. You left no stone unturned with this book. How important was it for you to put all those details into in, in, in your life, into literature? You know, I don't think that I ever felt like that I was doing it because I thought it was, was important, but I did know that I felt a calling to have to tell the story Be, because it wasn't something I wanted to do in the first place. Like other people talked me into it. And oh, really? Yeah. And actually my vocal coach in Nashville back in the nineties, when I was living in Nashville, I went there to songwrite, learn songwriting and singing. And I was playing music there and, and traveling around there, that part of the world, you know, or the country, I had the singing teacher and I went in and said to her, you know, they want me to write this book and I don't really want to, you know, I just don't want to go through it again. It's been 10 years now since Steve and, uh, you know, since Steve died and, I, you know, I'm really trying to get over it. And these fans had shown up on the internet because it was about 1998, 99 when the internet started happening. And all you Def Leppard people were like all over it. Like I was just learning how to use it. And you guys were all over it. And uh, they just kept saying, you know, they're they're on the internet and they're talking about you and they, they know that they want to know about Steve and you're the only one that really will tell, tell us anything. And so, you know, and I thought, oh, and so then I finally thought, okay, well, I had a friend who was a writer and I said, Beverly, she's in Nashville. She's a, she teaches writing uh, and music business in Murfreesboro, Tennessee uh, University. She said, I'll help you write the synopsis. And so I said, okay. Meanwhile, I was learning how to write songs. I'd been trying to write songs and I always had too much to say in these songs. I, I couldn't write short verses. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
<laughs> like I talk, right? <laughs> right? So I decided, she said, let me help you write the synopsis. So I sent that synopsis. I sent a package together to New York to some literary agents. And I actually got called in by a literary agent. And this was in like 1999. And my title for the book was Life After Death. And it was about oh, you know, how do that's we very clever. Off? Right. Yeah. And it was the Steve Clark story. And I went in. I just got that. Holy crap. That's an awesome title. Oh, my (laughs) God. Yeah. That's very clever. I like that. Yeah. Someone's probably going to steal it. If I don't, I don't, but whatever, you know, when I'll I'll, I'll split the royalties with you. It's It's okay. Out there. If you want. (laughs) So this literary agent um, and I go in and I meet with him and everything. And he said, you know, we like your, your idea and we like your synopsis, but we don't like the title. We want the book to be about you. And, uh-huh. and I said, well, what are you talking about? Why me? Like, nobody knows me. Everyone knows him. And, you know, who's going to care about my, you know, who's going to want to know? And he said, there are women out there that want to know your story and what you went through. And guys. And it, and it was during the time <laughs> of like when Oprah had her book club. This was in like late 90s book club on Oprah and blah, blah, blah. And there was that whole scene was going on. And he's like, you, 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 whoops, you need to, uh, go back, re- you know, give it a new title, rewrite it, do ha- tell me what your experience was, and then um, we'll talk. So I went back to Nashville and I was like, oh, God, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> to read a story about me. And I was kind of saying this to my vocal coach, to this lovely spiritual woman who just I really looked up to. And she said, I said, Anna Marie, they want it to be about me and they want me to change the title and you know, uh, who's, who's interested in my story? And she goes, I am. <laughs> and she was in her forties. She goes, I don't know anything about what it's like to live out on the road. I don't know anything about what it's like to live, to be a model and to travel from city to city and wear designer clothes. I don't know anything about what it's like to be engaged to a rock star. And she said, you know, there, I'm sure a lot of women like me that would like to know that. And she said, you kind of owe it to us. And so she I guilted went, you. Yeah, no, yeah, pressure. This is how, no pressure at all. Nice. <laughs> and she was my singing teacher, right? So she was my vocal coach. And so I was like, God. And so I went home and I thought, okay, I'm going to rework this thing. So I reworked it and changed the name to Runway Runaway. And then I went back to work on it. I was in contact with this literary agent. And at the time, it was really a good thing to have a literary agent, right? And I had a couple of friends who had had books, were having books published. And so I said, here I am. I was finishing the final, final touch of it. And September 11th happened. And I was in retreat, finishing the final master copy. And I was in New York. And so immediately, you know, everything changed. And uh, the, the, I started volunteering for the Red Cross. We were my girlfriend's model friends of me, mine. We were doing taking all the laundry for the fire workers you know, back and forth to the Red Cross to, you know, wash all the beddings and the sheets and the towels and things because they were, they needed beds like 24 seven. And so everything stopped. And so I just put the book away and then I waited and maybe a couple months later, and I reached out to this literary agent who had, you know, put me to the task. Right. And he goes, God, Lorelai, he goes, I wish I could help you. He said, but right now, if you've got a book on terrorism, bring it on. But nobody wants this kind of thing anymore right now. It was just that. Oh, time. It was like It was kind of like COVID, you know, it was like changed everything. I shelved the book. I put it away. And then I didn't come back to it for another eight years. And by that time, so many things had changed. So now people were self-publishing and doing audible books and things like that. And you didn't need the agent anymore. You just had to become a publisher. So I had gone to get my master's in spiritual psychology. And this they have this thing, instead of a dissertation, it's called a second year project. And so the second year project is something that's really close to your heart, like a dream that you absolutely have to make happen. And it has to be something challenging that's going to bring up all your stuff, because here we are in psychology school, right? So they're going to coach you through this stuff that comes up from this project that you do. And it could be any kind of thing. It could be getting a, you know, uh, walking across a tightrope if you had a fear of heights or something like that. You could be walking across the desert if you had a fear of being alone or whatever. So it was like you had to pick this project. 
uh, it's that book. I've got to <laughs> finish this damn book. I've got to <laughs> do this, right? And so that was my second year project. And that's how I, Siren Star Publishing started. That's how Runway Runaway started as the book. And then, you know, obviously into a brand, which is now like we were talking about my de- clothing designs and things like that. Yeah. Very cool. Um, you name a lot of names in this book. Were you concerned about the possible backlash of some of the names that you've mentioned, or did you have to? Oh clear no, I, no, 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 no. Because part of the part of the whole thing in school was, you know, everything had to be done out of integrity, and so it was really about okay. um, making sure that everybody was on board. And you know, I reached okay. out to everyone that I could physically reach out to and ask permission. And there were names that were changed in the book because some people didn't want their names to be in there, but most people I was really surprised didn't mind at all you know and by the way we are not going to name names because we want you to buy the book (laughs) (laughs) yeah we're Um, trying not to ask certain questions that'll give away certain things in the book we're working around it people that's what we're doing (laughs) i'll tell you the damn book it's worth it (laughs) you got to mention one name though because like you know that was the hardest one to get permission from and that was do you know is he in the band is he that the third Yes, that's the, <laughs> yeah. they call him the red pen. He's an editor. He was an English major in college. And uh, and that's why he's such a great songwriter. But they also call him Mr. Red Pen. Any, anyone in the media will tell you he's a tough interview and stuff like that. So when I told him this was going on, he's like, what? <laughs> <You're> what <laughs> did you have to convince him like was it a lot of convincing for him or was he was he on board right away I don't think he really believed me at first <laughs> I <don't> think he <laughs> was like well, yeah, I bet he believes you now send me the thing send me the thing here's my address right. send me the thing and then I sent the thing and I didn't hear anything and then, like a month went by and I was like hmm and I had to do this over this nine month period of school time right because we had a delivery right. date. So I part of the process was reaching out to people and getting in touch with people and saying, here's what's going on. And also getting permission for all the song titles that were the title chapters, not the ch- title chapters, but the actual quotes from the songs. And I was trying to get desperately trying to get copyright, you know, approval and all that stuff. And of course, nobody was answering me and all this stuff. And so finally, one night I was sitting at home, it was Saturday night and I was doing my homework because when you're going from, you know, a degree like that, there's a lot of homework. And so I wasn't going out at all. It's it's always reading books, books, books. And Don called and he said, what are you doing at home on Saturday night? And I go, I'm studying. And plus I was stunned. All of a sudden I said, oh, have you had a chance to read the thing I sent you, the manuscript? And he goes, what? What manuscript? Oh, I don't know. Did you send me a manuscript? And And I was like, uh, yeah, like a month ago. And he said, oh, well, you know, do, do I really, do you really want me to read it? And I said, well, I think you should read it, Don. And he goes, why? He goes, <laughs> and he goes, oh, am I in it? And I go, are you in it? Oh, are for you the love of God. <laughs> are you in it? <laughs> like you were like such a major part of my life. What right. you and, and he's like, oh God. So I sent it to him again. <laughs> time went by and they were out on tour and then it got close to the date where I had to turn in this project and I hadn't heard what happened was he came back to me with the red pen he's like okay <laughs> I, know I can't stop you from telling the story he said but there's some things in here I I, I don't quite agree with what you how you remember them <laughs> oh <laughs> so it was that kind of thing so uh, we did a lot of back and forth for like six okay. months to for me to get approval but it was all really beneficial and um it's actually very uh cathartic for me and him too because it was stuff that's good he thought about you know and, and probably uh, was it was some of the stuff like he didn't realize how you felt about it yes like he thought and, he knew yes. Who, like, how you felt and he was wrong yes yeah. and, vice, and vice versa vice versa yeah like he wow. i remember uh he was talking about um mm-hmm. they were recording heart of the matter and he went into the studio next door where Bob Seger was. And he went in there and I assumed he was in there just getting high. And I kind of put that in there. And he, uh, and, and then he, cause when he came back, he just seemed really nervous and kind of jittery. And I thought, mm, what are they up to? You know, why was he over there? And, and he was just playing me the song. They were in the process of uh, finishing up the recording of that song. 
And so I mentioned that in the book. And when he read it, he came back to me and he goes, why do you assume that that's what I was doing? He goes, did it ever occur to you that I was really nervous that you were there listening to this new song of mine? And I was like, oh, no, it didn't occur to me. (laughs) It didn't occur to me because wow. I didn't think, no, because I didn't think that much of myself at that time. You know, Aww. I just didn't. I was younger. I was more uh, insecure. I hadn't, you know, done the work on feelings really strong inside myself. You know what I mean? So I took it that way. I took it more like a victim rather than a friend. I'm much Aww. more loving now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I never liked him anyways. He insulted Rush, so I have no love for him as a man. Oh, well, he insults everybody. Everybody knows that he's a, <laughs> curmud- or he's a curmudgeon. Everybody knows that. He knows it. And he was a curmudgeon <laughs> in the 70s? I mean, come on. Yeah. No, but I don't want to say I don't want to say that in a negative way because curmudgeons are good too. We all need them because they they speak the truth. And Neil Peart you know, was a better drummer. Just remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Although I do uh, love that Boys of Summer song, I'm not gonna lie. It's a, you know, that's a great song. <laughs> yeah, great it meant song. a lot. That song actually meant a lot to me growing up and driving out to uh, Long Island with the family in the summertime. Yes, I grew up as a kid in the best decade, so all the best tunes were out. So it was great. <laughs> I know, right? Mm-hmm. God, how fun! Really did, except for the deep cuts. <laughs> I love the deep cuts and the hits. It's all good. I just want to hear deep cuts. That's all I'm saying. So, especially after listening to the audiobook, I noticed two things. One, you should really be paid to narrate every book from the Holy Bible to the cat in the hat. I mean, really, Aww. you have a great yeah. reading story. Really and, and number two, damn girl, you can sing. Why hide that voice? Aww. Well, yeah. it was. You know, you can't do everything, you know, you can't do, I mean, there's, I think that I'm talented and I, and I, and I love to be creative. So I love to try everything. So I can't really be excellent at one thing because I'm trying to be great at everything. (laughs) (laughs) But you did release a song, right? Call your name. I miss you when the sun comes up. Oh, I did recording when I was living in Nashville. I told you I was there songwriting and, you know, working on my yeah. voice and doing all of that then. But then after the after I moved back to California, I started looking after my parents and I had to put the book away. I'd spent a couple of years work writing that manuscript and then I put it away. But during that time, I wasn't working as much because it cost money to, you know, you had to take that manuscript. You had to, you know, send it out to all these people. You had to print it, Mm. ship it, all that stuff. This is all stuff that you pay for. Right. And so uh, I moved back out to uh, California. My parents were in San Diego and I had to go back into modeling. So I got my agents in San Diego and my agents in Los Angeles to put me to work. And so I started working. And at the time, I think I was about 41 years old at the time. I thought I was going to be done modeling by the time I was 40, right? But life shifted, things changed. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, I guess I'm still doing this. And I was really grateful that I still could. Plus I was in this age stage where middle age, you know, you know, not middle age, but 40 something was now starting to be more popular in advertising and media. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Just like there's a whole category for people in their 60s, 70s and 80s. But I'm not ready to let my hair go gray. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too vain. <laughs> no, I like being a redhead. It goes with my personality, but I, I it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And like, you know, we all have these stages of lives that life mm-hmm. that we go through. And that book is really about one stage. You know, that one. what a stage it was. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what a stage. <laughs> That's true. 
multiple Definitely. stages. There were multiple stages. Multiple, yeah. All, all life's a stage. Runway stages, uh, <laughs> risers. You're a drummer, right? Me? No, I'm a guitar, a guitar player. He's a guitarist. Oh, yeah, you are a guitar. Oh, I'm sorry, but you were talking about a drummer, somebody else. Oh, well. I part- am happy to tell you, actually. So me and a couple of other friends of mine who on the other podcast that I ho- co-host, Ratsa Review, a couple of us are actually getting together to record our next cover song for our channel. And I'm happy to announce it to you. It's actually... We're not going to tell you what it is. It's a secret. <laughs> Oh, really? You're going to cover it? We're going to cover it. And Yay, I'm like you. so excited about this. Nice. I've always wanted to do one of my favorite Steve solos. So it's a big trip for me. I can't wait to uh, share it with everyone once it's out. But until then, enjoy your other covers of Kiss and uh, Alice Cooper and Van Halen and other stuff. You know, it's just it's 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 fun for us. You know, it's something we were doing during the pandemic was just, you know, being able to do that and just kind of like collaborate and and like you you recorded on garage man your podcast let's yeah. let's not uh you know take anything away from it you did a great job doing it and that's what we use to record the songs with too it's not a big secret people garage band's an awesome tool yeah well <laughs> that helped me set that up because i i would have had no idea <laughs> but if you guys are you know really into it i'm just not that technical <laughs> yeah you'll learn we we learned it we were both instructional designers of icon we were like denise do, you, do we know what we're doing no let's learn it as we go no. along yeah, yeah right just gotta That's fumble right. through it fake yeah. it till you make it that was our that was our phrase <laughs> fake it till you make it keywords <laughs> fake it till you make it Woo. so this Ooh, is a i answer a... your question i can't remember what it was <laughs> no you answered it you answered it uh, oh yes <laughs> but um so the details of your <laughs> modeling career remind me a lot of what denise and i witnessed on a lot of reality shows that we used to broadcast on mtv and vh1 particularly oh. the modeling shows where you have the i'm gonna flat out say it the ugliest and creepiest people telling young girls things like you're too fat you're too short your nose is crooked go get braces mm-hmm. fix your teeth granted it's an industry that denise and i have no experience with other than what we see in print and on TV, but to the average person looking in, we can't help but think, oh, God, that's horrible. How superficial or no decent human being should have to be put through that. Or when it comes to the model itself, why would they allow that to happen to them? It, you know, it kind of like triggers questions like that. Yeah. Uh, and there is one thing from the book that rings true, which is also it rings true in other aspects of establishing a career in fashion or entertainment that certain businesses are all about rejection, meaning it doesn't matter how many times you hear no, it only matters when you hear yes. Have you noticed any substantial positive changes in the fashion industry from when you started until now? It's definitely evolved in a better direction as far as exploitation. And, you know, when this whole Me Too movement thing started happening with these actresses, I was, I just remember watching and going, really like that happens to us all the time and it's it has been since the beginning i mean if you start to ask models about sexual harassment forget about it i mean it could go on for hours and hours and hours but the thing was you had to learn to be tough you either had to learn uh, you know and that was one of the reasons why i wanted to talk about it in the book was just that you know if anybody had told me more and prepared me more then i would have been you know, much more savvy on how to deal with those people, because what happens is they dangle these carrots. You want to be successful. You have bills to pay. You want to, you know, be with the stars. And, you know, I mean, as far as like your, your girlfriends, like some of your best friends might be more making more, getting more bookings than you. It's a competition thing the whole time. Right. And so they dangle the carrots to help make it easier for you. And, uh, and it isn't easier for you if you sell your soul to the devil. And I w- was not going to do that for fame. Some of my girlfriends did, and some of them ended up dead. And some of them ended up depressed. And some of them ended up alcoholics. Some of them ended up okay. I think I ended up okay, but I never would do anything for work or for a favor or something like that to enhance my career. And so therefore I didn't get the the best of the career either. But I certainly found myself in a lot of positions where I was put up against that. 
And the only thing was I was so kind of headstrong and stubborn. I was a runaway, right? I was like a punk. And so I, you know, when I said no, I, they knew I meant no, right? But had I been more savvy, I might have finessed them a bit and like, you know, just got them to like me anyway. And then, you know, and therefore help promote my career. But I, I wasn't savvy enough to be like, oh, you know, I'm really flattered. Thank you so much. But, you know, I'm not available that day or whatever. And I rem- you'll you remember the part in the book where the guy, uh, uh, the agent said to me, calls me up on the first day that I'm in the agency. And he goes, yep. That's want exactly to what I was thinking of when I asked yeah. this question. You want to have dinner tonight? And I said, right. Well, yeah, I'd love to. I said, but you know, I have a boyfriend. Right. And he's like, right. I did not call the devil about your boyfriend, you know, and <laughs> I swear to God. After that, he put me on a shelf. He kept me in the agency so no one else could make money off of me. But he did not promote me to his friends and by the way that particular guy right now is um there was a thing in the uh new york times a couple of weeks ago he's being investigated now for all that i'm not not surprised i just want to say karma never forgets an address people just remember that It's true. <laughs> it's true. No, yeah. You're right. You're but the I, voice of reason. And it's true. <laughs> Everything comes back also, around. I also feel like those type of people, even if you were savvy and and tried to get on the good side, I still don't think that if they didn't get what they wanted, that that they would still be done. There are just some people who are just, nope, I want this. And if you're not going to get it, give it to me. I don't care how nice you are. I don't care. Whatever. I'm yeah. You want a shelf, like you said. Yeah, that sounded like a lot of the stories that you told that sounds like how these people were. So the fact that when you were like, you you know, it was a hard no. And you were like, no, yes, yes, you go. You tell them, don't don't let them get, you know, don't let them try and drag you into that. I was like, yes, I was so proud of you. Yeah, I was like, like, well, it just got to be like, don't even bother with Lorelai. But they, you know, in Italy, it was fun because they liked having me at the parties. They thought I was funny. And I learned the language. So I was able to joke around in Italian and they liked that too. So I was always invited, you know, and included Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But, but, but in Paris, it got harder and they're all, they're all buddies with each other, you know, Mm -hmm. New York, Milan, Paris, all these agents, they're all like in it together. It's kind of like a mafia. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Jeez. But I mean, really, I was just like so proud. I mean, I was a geeky kid from from Queens. I had been bullied. I stood up to my bullies. So when I saw that you stood up to your bullies in your book, I was like, yes, go, go, screw them. <laughs> Not literally, but I mean, you know, like, screw them. <laughs> Thank Thank you. Gula, as they say in Italy. <laughs> yeah, from, yeah, you know, you got to... No one can let themselves be bullied. Absolutely. And, you know, stuff. You got to yeah. stick to your guns. Yeah. And, Amen to uh, that. If you could give any advice or warning to young kids out there who want to enter this path, what would you say to them? You know, based on your experiences and things that you've had to come face to face with. Well, you know, I used to think that I had a lot of advice to give to younger people, but now the younger people are so damn smart that we yeah. don't really have to tell them anything. They're like smarter than we are, but it, <laughs> when, but it comes to wisdom Uh, I wish that, you know, I could pass on some wisdom and that would be to just really inform, you know, inform yourself and make sure that you know that modeling is a business and that uh, to be a professional model and to be uh, in business for yourself, you are a self-employed person. So every decision you make has to do with your own success. And so, Making the right decisions as far as agents, photographers, where you invest your money into it, and making sure that you're working with people that you can trust. Then if anybody tries to hit on you or anything like that, just learn how to give a nice, polite, diplomatic, no, thank you, but thanks anyway. You know, (laughs) just kind of, you know, just uh, be graceful about it and just be and, and, and don't talk about it. Just handle it. 
that's the thing. Like when I watch this Me Too movement thing, what I see a lot was there were a lot of opportunities where some of these gals kind of knew what they were walking into. And why were they going okay. in the freaking first place? Like, how about everyone take accountability? Do you know what I mean? Okay. Women yeah. have to take yeah. accountability too. If they can't step up and say no to things like that, I knew when I would be invited to parties and things like that in Paris but with the agencies or the photographers that there was going to be this kind of thing because I it had already happened to me when I was like 17 when I got taken down to that island so it's like okay right, I right. knew what was happening and I just so I wish that they'd be informed that they may be in these situations and how to deal with that so they know that before while going in there okay when this happens here's what i do it's like you know if you have to take self-defense take self-defense you know right i'm i already plan on signing my daughter up for taekwondo lessons so don't even worry about that yeah exactly (laughs) oh gosh a dad has to worry you know about his daughter i'm sure it's a great way to empower your empower her and that's the thing you have to empower yourself And then the other thing that I would say is to also empower yourself from the inside out because it's a very insecure business. And Mm -hmm. the reason why in, and something you had said earlier that a lot of girls allow themselves for things like this to happen to them is because they don't have the confidence in the first place. So they don't have the confidence Mm -hmm. to stand up. They don't have the confidence to think that they're, they're worth more. You know what I mean? It's about yeah. Worthiness. So there are a lot of self love. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a lot of girls in, in the industry. I mean, let's face it. We're, I was a runaway. I was, you know, looking for attention. We're, we're all out there for a reason, you know, and it's just a vehicle to have your life's learning. You know, I got the yeah. vehicle because I got the height and the skin and the, you know, luckily I was blessed by both my parents with the features that it took to be a model. And yet you can have all that and still fuck it up. Excuse my language. <laughs> you could totally curse. <laughs> you know it's all I mean? good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of times they think they can't say no and they need to learn that they can say no. Yeah. And like or, you said, yeah. like I said before, don't put yourself in that position don't in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't go sh- knocking on some guy's door and, he, and go in. He's in his bathroom. You yeah. stay in the hall or you leave or. Duh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I caught you the yeah. wrong time. See ya. You know, <laughs> and, and be ready to walk away from whatever that power thing was. That's the thing. When I say sell your soul to the devil, you know, mm. some people yeah. are so uh, wanting it. So fame or fortune or whatever, so badly that they do whatever Turn around and go, Hey, you did this to me. No, you did it to yourself. Maybe you weren't, uh, they weren't healed enough inside of themselves to know that they were worth be- more than that. That's the battle. And that's yeah. why this is awareness and talking about this stuff is so important is that we all have to be mm-hmm. accountable for ourselves. And when I say be accountable for yourself, that means go in and take accounting of yourself and, and the good stuff about yourself, you know, yeah. the really good mm-hmm. stuff about yourself, because that's the stuff that makes you feel worthy. And then, you know, care about all the rest of that i noticed that 21 myself when i was in a band and we were on the verge of (laughs) signing a record deal and when i saw the deal i said to myself i don't like this i was the only one in the band advocating for you know not as you call it selling your soul to the devil which is exactly what we would have done had we had signed it i mean i probably would have been in debt like Ugh. i couldn't believe i mean it, mm. it this, this isn't this was a deal where it's like the label wanted to own our copyright they wanted to own our publishing they wanted to own our band logo our likeness our songs <laughs> and i was like no i wouldn't no. do it no so yeah. i walked away from it and some people go you know how stupid do you feel that you walked away from the dream i'm like I didn't walk away from the dream. I walked away from a nightmare. Who says that I'm not still playing? Who says that I'm not still enjoying life? I mean, yeah, my responsibilities have changed, but you know what, though? I determine my value. You don't. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's a shame that young young people, young kids, girls and boys, guys, men and women, you know, <laughs> they, they 
they there is a world out there that is ready to exploit them and yeah and i you know just yeah. stay away from the toxic crap that's that's all i could say and if you surround yeah. yourself with enough good people you yeah. know you'll be able to tell who's honest and who isn't i mean like like denise has been one of my dearest friends for 20 years you know like i i feel blessed knowing that i have her in my life because people like her keep me on the straight and narrow Thanks, Denise. <laughs> Yay! Good for you. Stay. <laughs> you too. Denise. Make sure you stay in line. <laughs> I will. You. No, you know. The, yeah. I mean, like yeah. you know, there, there was a point in my life where I I had gone through a really big bout of depression. I had I had just lost my brother. You know, my brother Mikey. He was forty seven when I lost him. I lost him to a heart attack. And oh, he was the reason 47? I became. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, he yeah. was the reason I became a musician in the first place, you know. And Denise was one of the people who constantly checked in on me to make sure that I was okay. And like when I wanted to screw up and hurt myself, I didn't because you know I had the love of my wife, I had the love of my friends, you know, people who genuinely cared. And uh -huh. that makes the difference for mm -hmm. helping. One one being able to determine their value. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you Sorry, know, Dee, I just had to put you over. I had to. No, but you know, <laughs> Lou, you had said to me earlier before we started the interview that uh, the uh, that this was a dream of yours to do something like this. That what you what you're doing now with this podcast, and uh, it, it came to you through the time of COVID, which was the time. You know, one of the upsides of what's been going on over the last year and a half or two years now, whatever it's been, uh, with the lockdowns and all of that, as families coming back together, have people having more appreciation for each other, friendships like yours mean so much. And, uh, and also, you get to have that time to be creative and yeah. to come up with this new avenue which is I'm, I'm proud of you for jumping on this what you're doing which was your dream which you may not have been able to do had that not happened you know what i mean so we had to all the part, yeah. positive things that have come out of covid in the sense of people mm. are kind of listening to their hearts more like god i could die people are dying or whatever uh, what do i want to do with my life Pretty and much, so, and we, right? And we hope you're enjoying the time that you're spending with us because I know we are, and yeah. <laughs> um, and we make it a point to never get political on the show. The moment anyone does, I stop it right there because yeah. we want yeah. people to enjoy these episodes for years to come and not have to come back and go, "Oh my God, what are they saying?" Uh, you know, like I, we avoid politics like the plague. This is about music. It's yeah. about yeah. Well, yeah. music is life. <laughs> there you go. There. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know. Do you know what? Yeah. Did I tell you this in um did I tell you this, Lou, in the email when I replied to you? My father was was a lifelong musician. And he played lead trombone until he was 90 years old and he was in four or orchestras. Whoa. That is yeah. crazy. And, yeah. And my mother wow. was a singer. And well, it's all in there, but uh what he said to me at, towards the end of his life is music is my therapy. If and I didn't have it, it would have gone crazy a long time ago. So I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. And if he said it once, he said it like a hundred times. Music is my therapy. So when he died, I put that on the, you know, the quote, his quote on the, you know, how you do the little pamphlet at the, at the um, memorial service. Right. And, mm -hmm. I, and it said, music is my therapy. And Aww. I think that's another thing that all of us have in common, especially the whole Def Leppard crowd world, you know, all, all the, they're like a family. I love this. Yeah. They're very supportive of each other. You are, we are. I feel like in a, in a sense, maybe now I'm, I'm, I'm a fan, you know I mean? I, I'm a <laughs> fan of Def Leppard in the sense of they're fantastic, you know? And I yeah. think that they're fantastic. And boy, talk about longevity and getting through stuff. Those guys, they, oh yeah, survivors. So you have degrees from the master's program in spiritual psychology and consciousness, health and healing from the University of Santa Monica. Yeah. You're a graduate of Allison Armstrong's PAX programs, Peace Between Men and Women. You are a facilitating counselor with the Freedom to Choose Foundation, 
working with inmates at Valley State Prison for Women and helping them to make better choices. See, I study you. Uh, working with <laughs> inmates at Valley State Prison for Women and helping them to make better choices for their lives so as to avoid incarceration in the future. Your own nonprofit, I Am Dreams with Wings, <laughs> teaches <laughs> critical life skills to at-risk teens. And you've also created the Shellis Music Scholarship at Mesa College in San Diego, providing full tuition for vocational students of music. So, in other words, you're doing God's work. Jesus H. Goddamn Christ! I have seen the light! That's really what you're doing. Right. <laughs> no, and wonder, no wonder I'm exhausted. I was going to say, where do you find the time to breathe? I mean, geez. Well, let's just say that you just read like kind of, you know, a bio of things. And, and all of that really was, in fact, taking place until COVID. Things have slowed down a lot. Um, first of all, we can't go back into the prisons yet. Mm -hmm. So that took away that off my plate because we would go four times a year at least to a valley state and also out here to chino to the prisons there but there are there are doing online things but it's all zooming and uh there's too many i had to choose my zooms <laughs> and so i'm i haven't actually been working so i've i've just been choosing other things i have larry in my life now and so things are the priorities there are a lot of priorities and I had a wedding to plan in July. Led down the aisle by Mr. Phil Colin himself. Yeah. That's so wonderful. That I brother, love that. I love that. Phil. I've never been more brother jealous Phil. of a 60 year old buff vegan than him. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> he was so sweet. He was just so great about the whole thing. And they had such a good time at the wedding. But Jackson, he he's not used to being around enough people right now because, of course, he's three and he's you know the past year and a half of his life has been covid lockdown so all of a sudden there are all these people <gasps> around and he wasn't he wasn't digging it too much and but Aww. then you know i was really grateful to help phil and helen for coming and bringing him anyway because they knew, probably knew it would be hard for them but they really wanted to be there and had such a good time and and phil awesome. was just yeah it, it was just really sweet and it just it, and Larry's mom, and it's really interesting because Larry, Larry's mom, Doug, she was a model. Anyway, she introduced me to her son and years ago. Really? Like 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met Larry years ago. We didn't get together until a few years ago. But anyway, uh, she, she didn't understand why I was still talking about this guy on my Facebook page. And talking about Steve right <laughs> and couldn't understand it was like Larry who is this guy she's talking about and Larry's like oh mom it's cool it's you know he they were engaged etc yeah. etc et and Larry understood it and he works in media so he understands all that media and stuff too but she didn't quite get it and uh so I had to answer to her a couple of times about it because then I said really I only post now when it's Steve's birthday and it's uh, or it's his anniversary of his passing. I said, um, and it's because there are a lot of people out there that know me and want to feel connected. She didn't really quite understand and She hadn't read Runway, Runaway, even though she has the book. Right. And so she meets Phil at the wedding. And I we didn't tell anybody that Phil was giving me away. And not even oh, what a nice surprise. we didn't tell his, yeah. his children. We didn't tell anybody. We just, cause you know, we just kept it between us and Phil because we didn't want it to be about, you know, Oh, guess what? You know, Bill Collins giving, you know what I mean? It was just very low yeah. key. So his mom, even when we were taking the, just before taking pictures, she's like, who's that guy with Lorelai? <laughs> and so <laughs> she realizes that he's giving me away. Right. And she <laughs> went up to him after and she was talking to him and flirting with him and he was just ah. harming her and the next day I go over to her house and she goes oh you know that Phil Collin that band you know I googled him this morning and he's you know that he has a 12 pack oh, <laughs> and I said God. yeah I know that oh my so God. Hilarious. So now she starts Googling Phil and starts learning more about the band and then starts to see my name pop in there. And all of a sudden it's like, she's cool with it. Like she, she understands. She connected the dots. Yeah. 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 And she's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I think I'm ready to read your book. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, maybe you shouldn't. 